Welcome everyone. Welcome to this Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival virtual event. Uh, we have a series of online events, uh, interviews with crime writers. Now, this is definitely a crime book, although I wouldn't normally have described Deborah as a crime writer. My name is Catherine dupoulou and I'm the Artistic Director of Bad Sydney. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, and I'm sure you'll want to do that from wherever you're watching tonight. We recognise their continuing connection to land, to waters and culture, and pay our respects to their elders past and present. Now, for those of you, very few, I'm sure, who don't yet know much about BAD, we're an annual rock crime writers festival celebrating crime writing of all kinds. We also run events during the year, but our main event is in September, 10th to the 12th of September this year at the State Library. And it will be great, let's just, in terms of COVID, to be able to, or non-COVID, to be able to meet in a bigger group. And before we start, I want to thank our sponsor, the City of Sydney, who make it possible for us to do what we do. We also have a new relationship with Booktopia and we really appreciate their support as well. Now to tonight's interview, I'd like to welcome Deborah Oswald, a playwright, a novelist, to talk about The Family Doctor. Here's my copy of the book. It's a gentle and, conf uh, a gentle and comforting title, but the book is not gentle and comforting because it confronts the violence at the heart of the lives of far too many women. Thank you for writing the book, Deborah. It's important, an important book and welcome. Thanks, Catherine. Hi. Hello, everybody. Deborah will be talking to Suzanne Leal, also a writer. Her latest book is The Deceptions. And she's also a regular presenter of literary events. She's a judge of the Prime Minister's Literary Awards. She's a lawyer. And um, equally important, really, she's a great supporter of BAD and she's uh, a member of um, our board. Now, very quickly, I'll tell you how we'll be running this. I'm going to shut up in just a minute. Suzanne and Deborah will talk for about 45 to 50 minutes. Hold on to your questions so you can focus on listening. And about 45 minutes in, Suzanne will remind you to send them through Q&A. Um, and um, Suzanne will ask them on your behalf. I'll just pop back in at the end to thank our speakers. And now I will disappear and hand over to Suzanne and Deborah. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, what a delight it is to be here with Deborah Oswald. Now, I'd just like to reiterate what Catherine said about the cover and the title of The Family Doctor. Let's start with the title. I really love my family doctor. He's reassuring and it's all very comforting when I see the words, The Family Doctor. That is, of course, until now, because when you look at the cover of Deborah Oswald's new novel, it's of a house ripped in two and immediately think something might be wrong. Because when you turn to the back of the book, you see that this is the story of a family doctor who just might be capable of murder. And I'm wondering whether that's actually what we want of our own family doctor. So it is, Deborah Oswald, a startling book of friendship, <laughs> tragedy and moral dilemmas. It's hot off the presses. So what I'm going to do, Deborah, is just get you to set the scene. Just quickly, it's the story of three friends, Stacy, Anita and Paula. And right at the beginning of the book, an horrific event takes place, which we'll get to later. Before we get to that, Deborah, I'd like you to introduce us to these three women. Can we start with Stacy? Tell us about Stacy. So the three women all became friends when they were 12 years old. And, and it's the kind of friend, and they're now in their mid to late thirties. So it's one of those kind of trio of friendships that's lasted a long time. And Stacy is um, a preschool teacher. She's married with two little kids, well, an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old, and she's um, she's exuberant and kind of incredibly affectionate, and maybe a little bit needy from a difficult um, childhood. And then the other person in the trio is Anita, who is um, a journalist, but who now works in, uh, covers the courts. So she covers crime trials and so forth. Um, and she's smart and um, impulsive and um, again, a very sort of loving person, but can be a little bit sort of scatty and boisterous. Um, and then the third member of the trio is Paula Kaczmarek, who is a Sydney GP, the kind of beloved, dedicated GP that 
patients are loyal to for years and years. The, the one, you know, there's GPs where people save up their difficult problems to go to. So Paula's that doctor. She's kind of um, a very honourable, decent, caring person. Um, widowed about a year before the book begins. Um, um, so still in a kind of state of grief, but like a lot of doctors, I think, my sister's a GP, so in some ways I've kind of pinched her from my own sister. Um, she's one of those people who sees herself as the person who fixes everybody else's problems. So she's not really dealing with the grief of her, the death of her husband because she's, she's the person who fixes, she, she doesn't know how to ask for help. She's a kind of, um, she sees herself as sensible, caring and loving, but no nonsense, she'll find the solution to the problems. You know, I hadn't thought of that before. You know how they say plumbers are the ones with broken toilets. Yeah. Lawyers never have wills. Are you saying perhaps that doctors are the ones who look after everybody else's problems, but then shelve their own? I mean, I, I mean, doctors are a broad group of people, obviously, but I think, I think that's true for a lot of doctors. And, and certainly, um, I think it's hard for doctors to admit that they need help and that they've maybe their judgment is not, I mean, do doctors are required to be certain. Like when we go to our doctor, we want them to be, to know what's wrong with us and know how to fix it. So it makes us un unnerved if they, if they, if they seem too uncertain. So I think it's a habit of mind that doctors are trained into as well. We'll come to this a bit later, but um, my background, as Catherine said, is, is also as a lawyer. And I remember being a very young lawyer at Legal Aid, having a very difficult case that didn't go well. And I just wanted to sob. I just wanted to be there in the, in the courtroom and sob. And I almost did. But at the last minute, I thought, hang on. <laughs> the last thing these people need is a crying lawyer. And it seems to me that what you're saying, that it is that the last thing that a patient needs is a sobbing crying lawyer who can't cope. Yes, and, and, and a doctor who can't, who doesn't have a solution. Like, like for Paula not to feel, I think doctors are used to the idea that there's no, not always a perfect solution. You look at, a patient comes in with a problem, you, you examine them, you test, then you work out the most um, logical course of treatment, even if it's not 100% effective, even if there's risk involved. So as will become clear later in the story, that frame of mind has sets Paula up to make some extreme decisions because when she's presented with a problem and the solutions are not easy, she, and, and again, she's put under enormous emotional pressure. I think the pressure she's put under in the book plus the mindset of a GP creates a bit of a perfect storm. And I think that's exactly there. what you've created. I, I couldn't, um, define it as well myself. You've created a perfect storm. Before we get to the kernel of that perfect storm, I want to talk a little bit more about Stacey. Now, of these three women, Stacey, Anita and Paula, Stacey is the only one with children. And given that uh, Paula has been widowed, the only one who's married. And she's married to a man called Matt. Sometime before this scenario takes place, if I'd met Matt, how would he how would he strike me i think um the two the, the other two women talk about when they first met matt and he he was sort of sort of gentle and a bit needy and and a, and a slightly sort of weak person incredibly dependent on stacy that he seemed to kind of that he saw stacy as this prize that he'd won that he didn't really deserve and you know and sometimes his uh, stacy's friends think dead right mate you didn't deserve her um Stacey comes from a very messed up family background and she used to joke that she had a family deficit. So she's got this incredible drive to create a family. So when this man comes along who's besotted with her, who's kind of seems sweet and, and, and kind of pretty like a sort of rumpled puppy, he comes along and says, you are everything to me. She goes for that. And, and there's another point in the book where she talks about, where Stacey talks about um, um, the fact that Matt is so dependent on her that he sees his happiness as, in, as, as springing entirely from Stacey. But of course, the converse of that is if he's unhappy or something's not going right in his life, it must somehow be Stacey's fault. So I think that kind of incredible needy dependence is at the core of their relationship. And 
and Stacy is kind of robust and energetic and in, with this great capacity to love. So she brings up those children with the most enormous love and kind of holds it together with this fragile man. And those children are Cameron and Poppy. Tell me a little bit about Cameron. I, I really fell in love with those little kids as, as you talked about them. What, what's, what's Cameron like? If I were to it's, it's, really, it's really funny, actually. Even you, you talking about them, I feel myself get a little bit tearful. It's so ridiculous. They're fictional characters and I love them. Um, so at the point that we really get to know them, Cameron is 10 and Poppy is 8. Um, Cameron is um, a kind of earnest little boy, the kind of little boy who's very sort of watchful and, um, and protective of his mother and protective of his sister for reasons that will become apparent. And he is the kind of kid who will check the escape routes in a room. I've known kids like this. Um, that he kind of wants to make sure, wants to understand the safe way out of any place he is. Um, and he's kind of, and sometimes Stacey worries that he's too earnest, you know, and she, she likes it when he starts teasing Paula because, you know, and dares to be a bit cheeky. And the kids have been grown, the kids have grown up a lot of their childhood on a remote property with no electricity or internet. So the kids are really good at parlour games and Cameron is really good at charades and he teaches Paula to play charades. And his little sister, Poppy, is eight and she's, she's a little firecracker kid. She's, she's not anxious. She's just kind of a ball of energy. And um, there's a scene that I really love where Paula plays charades with the children and, and, uh, and Paula is, is, is learning, is, is pretending that she's not very good at it and letting Cameron teach her. And he's so proud of that. And he's so proud of his little sister being good at it. And um, so uh, they're gorgeous, <laughs> those kids. And now we need to take a bit of a deep breath because I'm going to take you to the book's opening. When the book opens, Paula's finishing her work day as a GP at a at Marrickville family practice. Stacy is separated from her husband, Matt, and she's been staying with Paula. Walk me through what she sees when Paula opens the front door that day. So Stacy and the kids have been living with Paula for six months. Um, so she's become very close to them. She's become almost like a second parent. And when she walks into the house, the kids was, have just come back from soccer and she sees something broken on the floor and there's a smell that she recognises, which is the smell of blood, which is a doctor she's, you know, used to. And she walks into the lounge room and she finds her friend Stacy um, shot dead on the floor. And while she is rushing down to see if she can help Stacy, she gets an eye line through into another room and sees Cameron and Poppy hunched up together with Cameron shielding his little sister like curled around her. But when Paula gets there, um, the, both children ha are also dead, they've been shot dead. And while she's on the floor dealing with this, Matt walks into the room. Matt, who was supposed to be in jail in Queensland, um, walks into the room with a rifle in his hand and he makes eye contact with Paula um, and then shoots himself in the head. So we're not giving away plot there because that happens in the first several pages, doesn't it? And I must say, it's um, startling. Like I said, when I looked at the book called The Family Doctor, the opening was not what I expected and it's really quite confronting. What I want to talk about now though is how you manage to have such a confronting book and still want us to know more and still have us engage with the characters. So from the beginning we know that Stacy and her children are dead and Matt as well but as the book develops we get to know them almost as though they're still alive. And so each time we think of their death, it makes it more gutting. Was this intentional? Was this intentional in order to give the voice to these dead victims? Absolutely it was. It's a really great way to put it. Because um, when I first thought about writing this book, I thought, um, I'm not sure that I know how to write about it. I mean, I, I was burning in my belly to write about this stuff, but I didn't know how to write about it that wouldn't just be just too horrible to bear. And then I thought, well, there's all that anger and, and despair that so many of us feel about this kind of violence. But there's also other positive, powerful forces in the world that we can weld together 
to make a story. So in the case of this story, those positive forces are female friendship, the urge of good people to protect vulnerable people. And, and, it, and it was really important to me that, that the beautiful things in this world, so just the wonderment of children and love and having a really good friend, those, that those things should be in the world too because it matters that, that terrible things happen because there are these gorgeous things that we need to protect. There are precious things that need to be protected. So partly, partly so that the book was not unbearable, but also partly because it's part of the story, isn't it? That, that the fact that people should be able to live beautiful lives like those children were living a little bit, that, that's, that's the scandal of it. So, so I wanted to keep reminding myself and the reader about what's, what's being lost, what's, what's at risk. It's interesting. Um, my recent novel, The Deceptions, is about the Holocaust and writing, or partly, and writing about the Holocaust, there is a tendency to keep to a level of hysteria because it was so awful, because there is so much horror, because there was so much terror. But there was also day-to-day -day existence. There was day-to-day -day of having something to eat. There was day-to-day -day of speaking to someone. There was day-to-day -day of making a friendship. And it seems to me that uh, this is a story in which murder um, is at the forefront, right from the opening pages, but you can't sustain a level of hysteria. So it seems to me well, one should not sustain a level of hysteria, even though horrific things are happening. So was it intentional again that you would show the day-to-day -day existence of a woman such as Paula dealing with the trauma of what's happened, but also dealing with the everyday things? Yes, I think that's right because it's one of the things that, that it's one of the reasons I have um, in other work I've done had a mix of of the comic and the dark. I mean, this one, this book is <laughs> leaning very heavily to the dark um, and not comic, but there's still light in there, and I think. Because that to me reflects life, doesn't it? That even if something absolutely terrible happens to us, we then walk into a shop and have, you can be in this state of mind where you're in terrible grief about the loss of, of someone very dear to you. And you walk into a shop and have a quite cheerful conversation with somebody. And, and that's the sort of weirdness of human existence, isn't it? That, that, that both those things are true. Both those things are part of life. And, and the story is partly about how Paula and Anita go on after the murder of their friend and the children and and how that can be a weird mixture of the one minute you're living your life as if nothing has happened and the next minute you're just you just fall to pieces um and I don't know whether I'm jumping ahead here in terms of what what you're planning to talk about Suzanne but it's one of the reasons I made sure there was a love story in the book mm. um partly because I wanted to make sure that the, the, the image of respectful, tender relationships between men and women was part of the world, because I believe it's part of the world. Um, but also because I thought it was really interesting that, that Anita feels guilty about having this frisson of happiness, this little sort of oasis of joy with a new man in the midst of all this pain. And again, I, I, I think that's really interesting because that to me is reflective of the weird mixture that most of us deal with. And I think you've, you've really struck a chord there when you've speak, spoken about either writing drama and tragedy, or sorry, either writing tragedy or comedy. But it's not really binary, is it? It's not a switch up or a switch down. No. Because life is not all tragedy or all comedy. It's not all hate or all love. And so by putting in um, the love interest with Rowan and Anita, there is exactly there is a grappling between how do you deal with beauty and horror and how do you put them together and understand them both together. Absolutely. And, and, and I don't think they're drawing from different worlds. I don't know quite how, that's probably a terrible metaphor, but um, uh, there's kind of life force and there's things that are trying to destroy it. And so they're absolutely intertwined and, 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 you can laugh at ridiculous moments. Everybody's, everyone's experienced that. And, um, and you can feel a burst of joy in the midst of a very dark moment. So, um, um, and, it, and it's one of the other things that, one of the other examples of it in the book is 
is there's a there's a big court story in the middle there's a big court case in the middle of the book and one of the things I wanted to do with that which has lots of horrendous detail in it uh, lots of very distressing detail but part of why I wanted to do that court story was that some of it is about a celebration of the woman who is the victim in that other case and and I wanted to hear from her friends talk about what a gorgeous vibrant young woman she was because we so often in in, in crime stories focus on the nasty evil person or the very dark final days of, of a victim but I wanted to remind everyone of what a lovely young woman she had been and so um, a court case is a way to have people talk about that and remind us about that. And of course the court case you're speaking about in the novel is the court case of John Santino. Um, we've got to be careful obviously how we tread in this book because there's so many uh, secrets and so much that is unexpected um, or that we're waiting for but I just would like you to describe for me John Santino. Who is this man and why has he been charged with murder? So in the aftermath of the murder of Stacey and the children, um, Anita and Paula are wrestling with that. I mean, that's the kind of been the main target for them up to this point. But in her job, Anita is covering a murder trial of um, a guy who, oh, I don't want to give too much away, it's quite tricky, isn't it? Um, of uh, a guy who is, who is accused of pushing his, his girlfriend off, a, off an overpass to her death. He's claiming that it was um, a suicide and that he was trying to stop her jumping off instead of pushing her off. And he arrives at court every day. It's a big trial. It's, you know, he's a kind of, he's the youngest son of a wealthy um, family in the concreting business. So lots of money, um, a bit of a sort of spoiled younger son, very vain, very, very um, full of himself, very controlling. And he arrives at court every day. He's, he's out on remand. And he arrives at court every day, out on bail, sorry. He arrives at court every day with his new girlfriend, who is eight months pregnant and who happens to look identical to the girlfriend that he's killed. Oh, sorry, I've given it away. To the <laughs> oh, well, sorry, guys. Um, well, <laughs> well, the girlfriend that he is accused of killing. Um, so, um, so Anita is covering that case and getting to know all the, all the characters in the story of Kendra, who's, who's been killed, and also watching with horror this, this young woman supporting him and being part of the sort of, and we've all seen these, these cases in, in outside courtrooms, the sort of parading of people on the way into, you know, Downing Street Court um, to show that you're a nice guy and you've got a sister who loves you and a girlfriend who loves you so you can't be a terrible person. So, and Anita becomes fixated on, on, on that young woman and how vulnerable she is. It's, it's a fascinating case and it fascinated me too because I must say it reminded me a little bit of the Simon Gatani case. Now that's the case um, for, for the audience where um, a man was convicted of throwing his girlfriend from the balcony of a 15th floor um, building. Um, was that a case that you were aware of? Is that a case that um, was useful in your research or how did you, how did you think of this Santino case? So I, I talked a lot before I started writing the book at all to um, friends who are criminal lawyers and um, an incredible woman who is a former magistrate and former coroner who talked through the stories with me and, and checked that I'd kind of roughly got it right. Um, and there were, I, mean, I mean, the sad truth is there are so many cases. Mm -hmm. um, the Gatani one was one of them, and and there's a um, and because that was a judge only trial, there's a very long there's like a fifty or sixty page document written by the judge explaining the circumstances and her thought process. Um, um, but I didn't. But then there's other cases too that are that have all sorts of intersections with it. So I I wanted to I didn't want any one case to be a copy of a real case because. It's, it could be a distraction. I mean, the beauty of fiction is that I can mould, as long as something is true in its essence, the details of it can be, can suit my purposes, if you get what I mean. So I, um, I, I borrowed bits from that 
case, but bits from several other cases um, that I won't even name, because in some cases the people were acquitted. So <laughs> I can't even name them. Um, so, you know. Was that difficult research or when you research, are you so focused on what you need to find that emotionally it doesn't drain you? Um, it's a really interesting question. Sometimes it would really drain me. And it's funny how um, you think you're okay. Like you think, you think, right, I'm reading this, I'm looking, um, I'm looking for this particular um, um, piece of information. I'm being quite logical about this. And then some detail will just catch your breath and I would be in tears. Um, and, and sometimes that just, it's just, there's no choice about it. That's just how you feel. Sometimes in those moments of emotional distress, you can discover good things. You can discover, ah, if, if this were me in this scenario, this is how I would feel and therefore I might think this or I might do that. So sometimes it can be almost part of the research to emotionally go there. Um, um, and then I think one of the things, there are some cases where there's audio that was played in court and that would just, that would just slay me. That would just destroy me. And, and in this book, there's a scene where some audio is played and, um, you can, you can hear all these, you can hear all, I mean, Anita's a very experienced journalist, you know, she's seen lots of gore, she's, you know, lots of trials. And so she's kind of okay with the forensic evidence, the pathologist, all that stuff. But when she hears the woman's voice on tape, that just goes through to some direct emotional place that destroys her. And that would happen to me in the process of researching. And so how do you get access to audio? Um, yeah, I, can, I can understand trial transcript and obviously um, you get um, judges' uh, judgments. Um, where do you find all this stuff? You would be amazed what you can find online. <laughs> Amaze me. I mean, I mean, maybe it's wrong that it's there, but it is. So yeah. on, online. So basically you go to the search engine and everything you want is there. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, yes, it's... Um, I mean, my Google search history at the moment is very strange looking. Yes, yes, <laughs> I, I can imagine. <laughs> I want to focus on a minor character who is John Santino's barrister, Gilbert Woodburn. Um, <laughs> I bet you. A, not, 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 not a great bloke. Do you want to no, just no. us quickly? Um, he's kind of early 70s, patrician, tall, sweep of silver hair, incredibly confident. Um, incredibly uh, manipulative with with um, um, with uh, witnesses and very good at kind of creating um, verbal traps for people and then needling them being smarmy and then needling them um, and very good at kind of playing that show off game with um, say a certain kind of judge who is impressed by um, Gilbert's performance um, and some of that came from many years ago. Um, I mean, this is how old I am. Um, I was hired to, this was in my mid twenties. So, you know, a long time ago, I was hired to um, research what was going, what then became Rafferty's rules that, that mm. court series. And I spent two months of my life in courtrooms and there is a particular lawyer that I remember from that time. And I remember watching him take apart a witness who was incredibly together and, and, and calm at the beginning of the process. Someone, a witness where you thought, this woman is, is fine. She's gonna absolutely nail this. And I watched him trick and manipulate and needle her until she fell apart. And I, you know, it's funny how memories can sit, live in your head for, in this case, decades until I needed it for this story. But I don't think it's an unusual way of operating in a courtroom um, by certain people, sadly. Um, you know, <laughs> well, you know better than me. <laughs> do you think, I mean, looking from a quasi observer's point of view, um, do you think that the system encourages that as it is? What I saw years ago and, and, um, and what I saw, because I went and sat on, in on some murder trials when I was um, working on this book, more for sort of 
of general courtroom atmosphere, not for the details of those trials at all. Um, I think a lot of justices are extraordinary people. Like I, I've seen a lot of judges who are very tender and protective of witnesses and, um, and very honourable in their judgments, I think. But there are a few who are not like that, I gather. I mean, I, just from talking to people. So for the purposes of my story, <laughs> I needed there to be um, a series of kind of accidents and things that go a certain way for the plot to go where I wanted it to. Mm. But checking with it, checking on it with various lawyers, it sounds, I, I think it's plausible. And of course, look, as a lawyer, when you go to law school, you're taught of the fundamental importance of the presumption of innocence. And you've also taught of the right to um, representation. I yeah. mean, obviously, that's a bit tricky when money is involved and when legal aid isn't universal. But um, do you think that many people find it very difficult to understand why someone like Gilbert Woodburn would represent someone as unattractive as John Santino? I don't know, because, I mean, we see it all the time, don't we? <laughs> I mean, you know, when you watch, when you read court, you know, the, the, the newspaper coverage and the television and radio coverage of, of, of trials, it's, it's, it's so often, isn't it? I mean, if someone's got the money, they can hire the most expensive person and, and sometimes those people kind of, oh, this is a very harsh thing to say, but they sort of rent out their plausibility, their, their gravitas to people who, you know, at some, at some other level, we all feel don't deserve it. But as you say, that's the system and, um, and it needs to be that way for all sorts of other reasons. Um, again, I think with the court case, I created a kind of, again, I had to create a kind of perfect storm where a series of things, I didn't want it to be straight out a hatchet job and I didn't want it to be, um, I didn't want there to be incompetent police. You know, I didn't, I didn't want it to be a story like that. I wanted it to be a story where everyone's doing their best mm. and a few little things go a different way and the outcome is perhaps not the outcome that we want. I don't want to give it away, but, um, um, yeah, and, and that happens, doesn't it, in the court system? And it really is very powerful. I mean, you really have, um, you really put me in the courtroom and I could see, I could see each of those characters. I'm thinking... Maybe you should think about a TV series. Over <laughs> to you. Well, we've, I, I've already sold the rights to the book to a producer that I really like. And um, Screen Australia have given me the money to write. I've written um, the first episode, so um, just recently. Because the thing with the book, as you know, Suzanne, is that I actually finished this book, you know, a while ago. But the process of, you know, editing it and preparing it for publication, by the time the book comes out, it's a long time since I've since I actually wrote it. Mm. Um, but it's been fun for me because in that time, I've also written um, a script for, uh, as a pilot for, the, for, for a miniseries version of it. So um, who knows, you know, fingers crossed. I remember years ago talking to Robin de Crespney, who is the author of the book, the very successful book, The People Smuggler. And before she wrote the novel, she'd spoken to a screenwriter and said, you know, this, I want to, I want to do a film, I want to do a feature film. And his advice is, was, look, do the novel first and then see how you go. So my question to you is, you're a playwright, you're a screenwriter and you're a novelist. Did the family doctor birth itself or, or come to you as a series or on the screen or was it very clearly a novel right from the beginning? Look, I, I, I'm always, if I have an idea I get excited about, I'm always thinking about what's the best kind of way to do it. Um, and i would written a kind of few pages on this as a potential television idea, but along with a whole swag of ideas, I was going to London to pitch to UK producers. So I was, when you go to those, to, on those kind of expeditions, you, you go with a whole bag full of ideas. So I had kind of half a dozen ideas and this was one of them. Mm. But even before I got on the plane, I just got so obsessed with this idea that I started writing it. And I wrote 10,000 words before I even got on the plane of it as a novel. So I guess it was gonna have to be a novel. And part of it was that um, I, I felt quite sort of 
driven to write it mm -hmm. and, and excited to have a go at something that's kind of slightly different for me. And, and they felt, and the subject matter felt urgent, like it had to be written now. Um, and, and the beauty of writing a novel compared to television is that you're not answerable to anybody. So, and because it's kind of quite a, an extreme, it's quite a controversial plot, I thought, I just want to have a crack at writing it the way I think it could work. I didn't know because it's a, you know, a wild idea. But I want to have a go and not have to listen to anybody else to begin with. Obviously, down the track, I'm answerable to a publisher and I'm answerable to the readers. But in television, you have to pitch yourself, you have to shape yourself, you have to um, respond to notes from other people very early on, like before something's even kind of revealed itself. Mm -hmm. So... I probably wrote this novel more quickly than anything I've ever written. And there's something about the momentum of the story. Like once we, once Paula does what she does, we are on a ride. And, and it felt like that when I was writing it, that I had to, I couldn't leave those women hanging for too long. I had to, I had to kind of sort them out. I had to kind of help them or find their way or whatever was going to happen to them. So yeah, it was, um, it, it decided to be a novel pretty early on. And once you have it as a novel and now you move towards a TV series, does that mean that if people question you about it, you can just say, well, actually, this is how it goes in the novel? And what I'm saying is that do you get more power in the writing room of a TV series because you've written the novel? Well, we'll see. I'd like to think so. I don't know. I mean, I, I think one thing that a novel... I mean, I, I already, as the adapter of the novel, I've started making changes to the story, and that Deborah Ozzel, who wrote the novel, can shut up. I'm just doing... I'm making... Because even, even already, I've, I've moved events around and concertina events for the screen because it's got different... It's a different storytelling medium. It's got different needs. The advantage, I think, to have already have a novel is that you can say to someone, read this and then see what you think. I think um, the, the difficulty, the scripts are very hard to read and, and a pitch for a television series, like a treat, what, what we call in the business treatments, which is like a 10 page document. They're very hard to read. It's very hard, unless it's absolutely a standard genre, bang, 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 hits all the marks. It's very hard for someone to, to know what it's gonna be like. Whereas at least when you read a novel, you can think, okay, I get this. I, I understand who these characters are. I understand how the story would, would sweep me from one event to the next. So I hope that it will help people in the screen industry treat the story with a bit more respect. Mm. But let's see. Google tells me that there was a heated auction for this book. <laughs> oh, I think sometimes there's a bit of hyperbole, isn't there? <laughs> Is it true? And if so, is that the first time that you've been involved in such a sale of a book? And how was it? So I've done children's books in the past and just tended to go with the people I've worked with before. My first two novels were both published by Penguin, um, where I was sort of persuaded to have a go at a novel by a Penguin publisher. And so did my second book with them because I'd had a good relationship, I'd had a good experience and, and I'm a very loyal person. Um, with this book, because that publisher had left Penguin, I, um, I didn't really have a publisher as such anymore. So um, I had a sort of 25,000 word um, um, chunk of book um, for people who read the book up to the end of Paula's um, um, medical consultation with Ian Ferguson. That's all I'm going to say. Um, um, so I think enough of the book that someone reading it would think, I get what this is. Mm. Um, and I had the rest of the story kind of in my head pretty much, so I could answer questions about it. Um, and there were just, you know, several publishers who were keen to publish it. So uh, I've never done that process before. Um, and can I say, it was delightful. Like for the first time in my life, instead of me being the supplicant saying, please do my work, which is what happens in the theatre and in television. This was for once I've had publishers saying, we'd like to publish your book. And um, so, um, but my experience with Alan and Unwin has been fantastic. Like, I'm, I'm so happy. 
Yes, we're um, we're sort of related then. We're both okay, related. Sta stable mates. I like to see the stable mates. Excellent. <laughs> um, and, I, and I do think um, the whole process of having an editor to work with you, did that, and particularly as Alan and Unwin had the novel before it was finished, was there was there a lot of discussion or did you just present the manuscript when it was finished and go from there? I know this sounds ridiculous, but I don't know that I remember very clearly. Um, I guess I talked about where I thought the story was going. I, I think they were fairly um, hands off at that point um, because I think we talked about what was intriguing about that first chunk in order to be clear about what the hook was and therefore what I should not neglect in the future. So just to understand, it was more to understand what that, how that first section worked and therefore what to keep in mind as I continued on. But um, they kind of left me alone to, to finish it. And, um, and I'm a fairly fast writer. Like, I, I mean, partly because I'm kind of, I've been, you know, making a living at this for 40 something years. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of, a diligent little person. Um, and also, as I said, the book was kind of like this roller coaster, not roller coaster, it was kind of like a train, you know, that had to get through um, to, the, to the end of the line. And, um, and then we, I showed Jane Profferman a first draft and we, and we talked about some story things. And often for me, people want me to add material. I think I try so hard not to be boring that I, I sometimes am too lean mm. and um and so some of the, the the notes were about adding material fleshing out some things um which is in fact a delightful note to get because you discover all kinds of cool things um but um they were just helpful and supportive and smart excellent there's there's a there's a, an advertisement for an excellent um publisher <laughs> writer relationship um it's already quarter to seven or just about. Oh, so um, I'm, I'm mindful I don't want to monopolise you completely, Deborah. and we've got a lot of people listening. And I'm just uh, wondering, for those people who have a question for you, could you please write in the Q&A? And, um, and once, I, um, once I receive the question, I'll be, um, I'll be able to uh, put those questions to you. So think about your questions. We've got 15 minutes for questions. Um, don't be shy to be the first person. After all, I'll be asking the question. <laughs> you don't even have to put up your hand. Uh, so while we're waiting for the questions to come through, I've just, um, I've just got a, another question for you, uh, Deborah. There was an interesting commentary that Anita makes. She reminds herself when she's trying to get information for a story, don't be afraid to let a silence run. People usually felt obligated to fill the silence and more of the truth would tumble out of their mouth. Do you agree with this? Is this what happens? Well, I, I think so. I mean, I, I mean, I've had journalists say that to me, um, that that's one of the ways that they, that they work. And um, I mean, over the years, I've researched all kinds of topics and I generally found that and I would say this to anyone who, who's, who's writing or thinking about writing, that, that to be bold about going up and asking people to help you. Um, that if you, I mean, I once wrote um, a thing said on a peach farm and I, and I contacted this peach farmer and said, can I come and hang around your peach farm for a few days? And he said, okay. And I followed him around his peach farm for two days and he finally said to me, you're really interested in peaches, aren't you? And I think if you're a curious person and the person that you're talking to can tell that you're really listening to them and really interested in what they're about to say, people will tell you stuff, you know, and, and, and people also don't like a silence. So they'll feel a silence. And if you, there's nothing worse than um, asking someone a question and when they're struggling to find their answer, offering suggested answers. I mean, sometimes that's helpful, but sometimes you're stopping the person having their own thought process and you're not hearing what might be a much more interesting answer. Yeah. Um, and I think for people, I think I speak for both of us, where we, we talk a fair amount, um, we make people feel comfortable, letting that silence sink is probably not necessarily a natural thing. Would that be what you'd say? Um, 
Yes, although I tend to be a questioner. So um, when, um, I mean, there's actually another bit in the book where Anita talks about the fact that when she meets the lovely detective Rahan Mehta, he asks her questions and follow-up questions and is interested in the answer. And she realises how rare that is, that she's so used to being at events where she's sitting next to some man and asks him question after question and he never asks her anything. So I've had that experience a lot where you're at a social event and you feel like you're an interviewer. Um, but I'm a sticky beak. I really like um, finding out about people. I like asking people about themselves and, and, and particularly the follow-up question. I think that's the crucial thing that often when somebody asks you something, you answer and they go, oh, great, which means they're not, but whereas if someone asks you a question about your answer, then you know that they're really listening to you. Thank you. And so I tend to be the person who's asking all the questions. We've got a question from Kathy, and her question is, what was the hardest part of the book to write? Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, some of the, the, the distressing parts were very hard. Um, um, but probably the hardest thing of all was, as, as for the whole project, was making the moral thread of the book plausible and understandable and find a balance morally that um, would be acceptable to some people. Without giving the story away, there are things the characters do in the book that I don't approve of and that I doubt any of you will approve of. But what I hope is that you find what they do understandable. And so striking the balance, and I was partly able to strike that balance because when you've got two main characters, Paula and Anita, they can have different viewpoints and confront each other and the truth can be somewhere in the kind of mix. Um, so getting that balance right, not, not, not dialing back the rage and the intensity of what happens, but not, I really didn't want this book ever to be the kind of book where the violence is titillating. You know how some, some crime books, there's a kind of titillation about it. I just did not want that. So, but I wanted it to be shocking in the way that it ought to be shocking. So again, finding the balance between shocking, but keeping the focus on the right part of the story. That was, that was tricky. Mm -hmm. We've got another question. And this is a question from Miranda. Um, and her question is about your one woman show. Is there something wrong with that lady? So it seems to me, Deborah Osgood, not only are you um, in your office writing uh, children's <laughs> books, adults' books uh, and, 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 and scripts, you're also on stage. Tell me about this latest performance. Look, I, <laughs> I, I'm making my stage debut at 61 years of age. So, you know, this old dog is, is learning a new trick. Um, it was meant to be on March last year and we got cancelled because of COVID at the very last minute, which was kind of, you know, annoying, but minor compared to the suffering of people who have had much worse things happen to them. Um, so it's coming on again in, in, in two weeks' time at the Griffin Theatre, which is, a, for people outside of Sydney, is a, is a tiny little theatre that only seats 100 people. And it's where I first got, started going to the theatre when I was 11 years old. So it's very dear to my heart. And I got the, the sort of wild idea of doing it because um, I used to occasionally do a storytelling stint at an event called Story Club, which was um, a sort of comedy venue in, um, well, a venue for all kinds of things in Sydney. And I was invited to tell a, a true story for 10 minutes. And I was so scared, I thought I was gonna vomit. Um, and my partner said, no, no, when groovy young people ask an old person to do something, the old person must always say yes which of course is true. So I said yes, and I discovered that I kind of loved it. So this is me telling stories about my neurotic childhood and my early years as a writer and what it's like to be a writer in this country for 40 years. So it's kind of like a family slideshow. It's a cross between a family slideshow and a really bad TED talk. Excellent. Excellent. And um, I understand it's just about sold out or there are, there are still tickets to be No, had. it's sold out, but partly because Griffin is only selling 65% of their seats because it's such a tiny little theatre. But I'm hoping that I'll get to do it in other places, in other venues. 
because we sold out, hopefully I'll get to do it. So I've what got to do 15 that? performances. I'm old. How am I going to do that? Yeah, Ram, you're not sounding old. You're not looking particularly old, Deb. I know you're, <laughs> me thinks you do protest too much. We have another question, though. And, uh, and this time we have a question from Alex. And Alex's question is, what drove you to write this book? What drove me to write it was those moments when you open the newspaper or you turn on the ra or you turn on the radio or the television and there is yet another woman murdered and often children as well by a current or ex-partner. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we all talk about it, don't we? We all talk about it with our friends about how angry we feel and how sad we feel. And that was the drive. But, but, I didn't want to tell a story from the point of view of a victim because I'm not, and I think that's a different kind of story. I wanted to tell the story from the position that I'm in, which is, and that many of us are in, which is the sort of anguished observer. So my two main characters are the friends of a beloved friend who's been killed. And it's about a way to challenge the rage that we feel, the guilt that we feel that we didn't intervene sometimes. And the desperation that Paula feels to save people in the future. So I think a lot of us feel those urges. So it was me finding a fictional framework to channel those feelings. Can I just follow up on that? You've said now that you didn't want to write the, perspective, the story from the perspective of a, of a victim. Now, is that because that wasn't the story to tell or because you don't think you've got to write to tell that story, not being a victim? I think that, um, oh, it's very, yeah, I, it's very dangerous to get into that territory of saying that authors can only write about things that have happened to them. I, I mean, I think there's certain areas where we have to be incredibly respectful and leave it alone, like Indigenous stories, for example. But I, I'm not of the school of thought that says you can only write about something that's happened to you because, good Lord, it'd be very boring, wouldn't it? Um, but I suppose I felt that, to, to write from the point of a victim would be, um, maybe, I felt, maybe I felt that it would be so crushing a story that it would be unbearable. Mm. Whereas this story is about, is about the sort of dark daydream of Paula thinking, what if we just killed some of those bastards before they hurt anybody? Which is, I guess it was more that that was the impulse that I had. So it, 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 it's really about the, the, my headspace, which wasn't as a victim, it was as Paula. Thank you for that. We've got a question from Greg Woodland. And um, Greg ha is also a novelist. And um, his question is this. First of all, a statement, then a question. Congratulations, mm -hmm. Deborah, for tackling such a tough and compelling subject. And I'm looking forward to reading it soon. The characters sound very complex, as does the story. You were really passionate about the subject. But how deeply did you have to know the characters before the plot took shape for you? Um, oh, yes, it's very difficult to, to sort of know how to, to, to sort of recall in a way, because it's all kind of... What was very important to me was that this be a story of friendship, not just a celebration of the strength of women's friendship, but also about the difficulties, you know, that, that you can, um, you can be, that there's those little shifts in dependency that happen and, and, um, and, and that way that we often assign each other roles in friendships, you know, you're the sensible one, you're the impulsive one and how that can feel frustrating and how in the case of this story, a lot of things can flip around. So that helped me get Paula and Anita because, um, I wanted it to be an interplay between two very different women. You know, Anita is a bit more like you and me in the sense that she's kind of raging and blasting and upset about all this stuff. And Paula is a much more sort of quiet, methodical, reflective person, not like me. Um, so that I think helped me find them. Their relation, the relationship between them helped me find them. Um, and then I tried to think of how Stacey could be the third member of that trio and what, what those other two women needed from Stacey, what the kind of person that would be the glue in their friendship. So that some of that helped me find out who they were. Um, often with novels, I do a different kind of research, which is I, um, I interview my friends about the story. Like I'll, mm -hmm. I'll say to my friends, this is what's going to happen. What do you reckon? Um, how would you feel if this happened? 
and that can be a great way to get different viewpoints and different, just different language, different answers people give to my, to my own perspective. So that always helps me feed into characters like this. Oh, there's a lot to think about there. We've got time for one more question. The question is from Max and Max's question is this. Do you have a preferred form of writing? Screenplays, fiction, plays? Uh, no, I really don't. Um, I, theatre's my first love and there's a lot to be said for rehearsal, but I don't write theatre anymore because the theatre broke my heart. Um, um, even though I'm walking, I, I, I'm effectively, it's effectively invasion that I'm, I'm claiming a stage of, of the art form that broke my heart. So I'm, it's revenge. Um, the beauty of screenplays is you get to work with other people and you have that camaraderie and you have talented people lending you their talent to make your show. Fabulous. But I do enjoy writing novels because I have control and there's something very nice about, I don't write flowery stuff. I don't write, oh, look at me writing. But that doesn't mean I don't work very hard on trying to find the exact word that I think will paint the picture in someone's head or, or help them understand what's going on in that the character's mind. So I find that process of, of prose writing really enjoyable. So I like doing both. Thanks a lot, Deborah. We've come just about to the end of our time. I'm going to hand over to Catherine, but can I say how great it's been to have you to myself for a whole hour <laughs> to talk about this terrific book. Um, oh, thank you so much. I understand it's going gangbusters. Everyone's talking about it. Um, I'll look forward to um, its trajectory and um, wait with bated breath for the TV series. <laughs> Congratulations, Deborah. Thanks, thanks, Suzanne. Yes, congratulations. Thank you so much for a really good conversation. And it was about the ideas in the book and what happens in the book. What I really enjoyed was about, it was about the writing process and the process of research and just a whole, you know, a really rounded view. Because um, it would have been easy to give things away, but what it, does, what it means now is that everybody is complete, their appetites, if they haven't read the book yet, are completely wet wetted. So like Greg Woodland, I advise you to all go out immediately if you haven't read the book yet and do that. And while you're there at Booktopia, you could also get Suzanne's book. They're both on the same page. It's really Which is wonderful. I love Suzanne's book. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you, yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much for that. I'll just tell you quickly about our next event. It's with Candice Fox, who's written the most gripping book, a completely different kind of crime book. Um, set in America and it, oh, that's on the 13th of May and, you know, really couldn't put it down in a totally different way. Uh, before that, and thank you to the City of Sydney for this, um, we're going to start the Bad Podcast Book Club. Um, so you'll be able to be talking about um, all sorts of books, uh, all to do with crime, and you'll be able to join in via Facebook. We'll have Australian writers and international writers and get you plenty of time to get reading and thinking about it. So I hope you've enjoyed the evening as much as I have. Thank you again, Deb and Suzanne. And um, looking forward to seeing you all next time, I hope. Thank you.